once you're in nursing school to keep an open mind, um, especially going back to what we talked about of all the avenues that you can pursue after nursing school. Um, I know not everyone is familiar with all the routes that you can take. And so keeping an open mind while you're in nursing school, learning as much as you can, but then also realizing that school prepares you, but it doesn't teach you absolutely everything and that that's okay. MDF Instruments. Welcome to our Crafting Wellness podcast. And today I would love to introduce you to Julia. Hi, Julia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Can you tell us, for everyone watching, just give a little quick introduction and let everybody know um, what you do and where you live right now? Yeah. So um, my name is Julia, as you mentioned before. I am an ICU nurse in Oklahoma City city. Um, I work at one of the downtown medical centers here. Um, I just started about six weeks ago, so I'm a recent grad um, and went straight to the ICU, so I'm kind of just getting adjusted to all of that right now, and I'm, I'm really liking it. So, Wow, I imagine right now, especially during a global pandemic, that um, being a new ICU nurse during this time has got to be more stressful than normal, because it's already stressful. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's interesting to say the least. Can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of fell into this position? I know I was looking a little bit on your backstory that you kind of started in um, pharmacology. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You were in school for that. I think I read for mm-hmm. six years. And then you yeah. kind of, will you kind of tell everybody who doesn't know a little bit about what that story is and how you got into ICU nursing? Yeah, so um, when I first started undergrad, I um, was admitted into a six-year pharmacy program at um, Rutgers State University um, in New Jersey, and I um, really was excited to pursue that, but as I went through school and even working as a pharmacy technician, I... um, felt as though what I really liked about that profession was the interaction with patients. And I felt as though in a community pharmacy setting, um, that was my only option to really interact with patient populations. Um, And along with that, I I honestly wasn't really that great in chemistry, which is a really big part of pharmacy, obviously. Um, And that was like very heavy in our course load. And I was making it through, but kind of just scraping through. So I just felt like maybe um, that was a sign that the profession just wasn't for me. So then I opened up and looked into other um, fields in healthcare because I knew I still wanted to do something in healthcare. Um, I ended up shadowing and observing for a lot of other professions like speech pathology, OT, PT, um, and a lot of uh, professions like that. But nursing just really Um, stuck to me because of how much interaction nurses do get with patients. Mm -hmm. Nurses are there the whole time at the bedside. Um, Even if you're not doing bedside nursing, you really are face-to-face with patients all the time. And I just really liked that one-on-one relationship with a patient. Um, So I decided to pursue nursing and look into schools that had programs that benefited me after I already completed a degree. in undergrad. Yeah, they call nurses the heart of healthcare for a reason um, because you guys are there through the scariest times um, when we are most vulnerable and feel most afraid and alone. Um, You guys are the ones who hold our hands through all of those dark moments. You're the comfort, you're the care. Your jobs are so important and I think it's really beautiful that that's where life kind of led you to and by just knowing that you liked people and you wanted to help and be around them and wanted like more of an interactive experience with them as opposed to uh, what you were going after with pharmacology. But um, that's really a beautiful story. It's always really fun to find out how people found their niche because there are so many different directions you can go. Like you were talking about, there's so many different specialties in nursing and in healthcare in general. It's mm-hmm. always the best part to just kind of find out, like, how did you find your niche? <laughs> and for yeah. watching, um, I'd love to kind of hear about what the job application was like for that. Like once you um, got into deciding, okay, I want to pursue ICU nursing. I assume mm-hmm. that you just, you graduate as, a, as an RN. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. or is yeah. it a BSN or? 
So the program that I was in was a little different because it's a dual master's program for people who already have a degree in something else in undergrad and they know that they want to go into advanced practice nursing. So to become some sort of nurse practitioner or midwife or CRNA. Um, so the first part of the program, um, I would say it to explain it to everyone else, it's kind of equivalent to a BSN, but we just take 15 credits worth of MSN courses too. Um, and along with a few other course um, inclusions, we end up getting a master's degree instead of a bachelor's in nursing. So officially I have a master of nursing degree. So um, it's really just because of that bridge between the entry level of nursing and continuing on to the MSN part. Um, but if I were to go to any other um, accelerated program for nursing, I would get a Bachelor of Nursing, Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, thank you for explaining that, because I think people can get really confused what the difference is between all of that, and I'm mm -hmm. still learning too, so it's really fun for me to also know. Um, so how long does that take, that whole process of schooling for to get a Master's in Nursing for you? How long was that? So I know that my school offers this program and a few others around the country offer the program. Um, and so where I went to school at Case Western Reserve University, it's um, a two plus two and beyond kind of a program. So the first two years, you get that Master of Nursing degree. Um, you learn all the entry level classes for what, what a BSN after graduating from an undergrad would take. So like most post-batch nursing programs, that's basically what it is. Um, it's four semesters long. We do get winter break and summer break in between just to kind of give us a little bit of a mental break. Um, and we take all those courses. After those two years, we have to sit for our NCLEX. Um, so we schedule our NCLEX, sit for the NCLEX, pass it, um, get our RN licensure. And then um, depending on what you wanted to do, you could move on directly to a nurse practitioning specialty. Um, there are a few that you can move on to without any work experience. I know some of them uh, are like um, family nurse practitioning, midwifery, um, a lot of the primary care practitioning roles you can go into without any work experience. But there are a lot that they offer that are acute care or require some sort of work experience in a specific area, mostly acute care roles require at least one year, one to two years of ICU experience or critical care experience. So I chose to do uh, something along that route. So what I am aiming to pursue right now is um, acute care adult gerontology. So in order to pursue that, I have to work at least a year in an ICU setting, and then I can um, continue on with the coursework for that specialty. Um, so the first half of the program is definitely two years. And then depending on how long the MSN specialty that you choose is, that determines how long the second part is. And it's anywhere from two years to like four years, depending on what the specialty is. I know you graduated during COVID. Um, how did that affect your graduation? Did you find a way to celebrate like over Zoom with family? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Thankfully, I was with family during my graduation weekend, so I was able to at least interact with them. But it was it was pretty different because starting in March is when they closed our whole institution and kind of sent all the students home and totally converted to an online format, which was um, an adjustment for us, but probably even more so of an adjustment for our faculty to be able to kind of restructure their whole curriculum to be able to be online because a lot of what we do is clinical work and labs that require in-person hands-on experience and from March to May um, pretty much a majority of that semester um, we weren't able to go to clinicals and we weren't able to go to labs so they had to find ways to make up for it so that we would still be gaining knowledge and experience but just not in the way that we were used to so it was a lot different um, and celebration wise they were able to kind of do an online ceremony that um, kind of put our picture up and all of that stuff. So that was cool. But of course, nothing is um, as it would be if it was an in-person. We didn't get a pinning um, like we normally would have and things like that. So that yeah. was kind of sad. But I mean, they did the best that they could considering. The yeah, I think the pinning part is probably the just the hardest thing to not be able to do because it's such a kind of big honor and step and it, it symbolizes a lot. But um, I'm sure when this is over, uh, 
maybe you can get together with everyone and you can all pin them on, pin them on <laughs> and find some creative way to celebrate because you guys deserve it. I know it's not easy um, what you do. So I'm proud of you and uh, <laughs> we're all like very honored to uh, have you doing what you do. So I would love to talk about, because I know you started your new job six weeks ago. So on the topic, I would love to hear about your what you think of it so far, your experiences, how much you love it, what it's been like with COVID, um, how you expect it to kind of maybe change when COVID is gone, and just tell us a little bit about uh, your new job. Um, so my new job is pretty great. Um, I got hired um, very close to when I interviewed, um, which the whole interviewing process was kind of long because in Oklahoma, there was a point where nurses weren't being hired, especially new nurses, um, because of COVID. They were kind of just gearing up to have um, more experienced personnel, especially not knowing what COVID was going to bring. So new hires were kind of on the back burner for a little bit. So it took um, up until about mid-June for me to actually make any headway with interviews and the hiring process. Um, but I finally um, was able to choose an institution that I felt really fit me um, in downtown Oklahoma City. Um, and I work in their medical ICU right now. Um, and I feel like the environment is just really great. It's a close-knit unit. Um, they see a lot of different kinds of patients. Um, the unit itself actually is the designated COVID unit at um, the hospital. So um, they have an MICU and then another wing called ICU West. And they kind of just share like um they share nurses and they share responsibilities um but they are like two separate wings in a, in a way so um they're when it comes to covid um micu kind of takes a lot of the covid patients and then if there's overflow there is uh one pod in the in icu west that is dedicated to covid so it's kind of blocked off from the other pods so as a new nurse, um, they don't want us going into the COVID units yet just because um, to conserve PPE and because we're in training and we're not experienced, you know, they don't want to put us in a situation that could jeopardize um, us or them, you know. So until we're done with our orientation, we're kind of going to be with our preceptor in a non-COVID um, area. Um, but once orientation is over, I definitely know that they could use the help and we can be expected to go and um, take patients in the COVID pod um, and the COVID unit. Um, but so far, it's been, it's been a good experience. It's a lot. Um, I've always heard that ICUs are very, in, obviously very intense as per their name. Um, but medical ICUs are different to me in a way because you get a lot of different cases and a lot of different um, types of patients from um, all all different specialties so it's not it's not concentrated to a particular system in the body you know like I've had neuro patients cardiac patients GI patients um, like psych mental health patients that have other uh, comorbidities um, so it's just really interesting to me as someone who just came out of school to be able to be exposed to a variety of patients instead of kind of just being tunneled into one specialty and not focusing on all these other things that I learned about in school. So in that regard, I really like the medical ICU. And as someone who is um, planning to go into advanced practice nursing, I think this was a perfect place for me to begin my training, um, just so that I can keep my knowledge of a lot of different uh, systems of the body and how that those conditions are treated and what leads up to those conditions, um, so that I'm not I don't forget. Um, I don't learn too much about one system and then forget about other systems completely. Um, so they've done a good job of, uh, I feel like in six weeks, I've learned so much. Um, one of the biggest things for me is I feel like I have so much more to learn. Um, the nurses that I work with, um, even the ones who have only been working for a year to two years, they're so knowledgeable that it's, to me, it's kind of hard to um, realize that maybe in a year or two, I'll be just as knowledgeable just with how crazy things are sometimes and um, how intricate some situations are that uh, that come on our floor. Um, but I, I'm kind of excited for that too, to realize that in a few years, like I'll be kind of just like them, you know, as long as I keep up with my training and obviously keep an open mind and uh, about learning and things like that. So I'm pretty excited. I think it's a good floor for me to have started and a good institution for me to have started with.
So yeah, that sounds really exciting and also seems like it's never going to get boring. <laughs> it sounds like you're yeah. Gonna, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm heightened mode because it's good. You're never going to really quite know where to go or what you're dealing with. Um, and you're going to learn so much that way because you're just going to get thrown into it. And mm -hmm. you're going to, like you say, you're experiencing things from all, all ends of the spectrum, which is also mm -hmm. really amazing. So I have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, I don't know the difference between um, an MICU and then the ICU West. Can you explain like in Lehman's terms, normally without yes. COVID, like what the difference is? So in actually, I asked the same question when I was hired because when I was hired, I applied for an MICU position. Um, both of them, both of them are medical ICUs. They're just in two different wings. So it's like they just didn't have uh, one area for all those rooms to be. So like um, back in the day, like they gave them separate names just because they were in two different wings. But both of them are medical ICUs. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I had the same question. Yeah, I, know. I was like, oh, I never knew. I was like, that's interesting. Um, I know that you talk about what, where you're trying to go in your career, um, your, what you're pursuing. Um, you said an advanced uh, nurse position. Um, can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about what that is for everyone watching who doesn't know um, as an option for where they can go with nursing, like how far they can go with it? Yeah, so nursing has so many opportunities for you to be able to um, further your education and your career. And one of the steps right after you um, do bedside nursing is to get your um, MSN. And with an MSN, there's a lot of opportunities. You can become a nurse practitioner. You can become a midwife. You can become a um, CRNA. Now CRNAs are moving more towards a doctorate, um, doctorate kind of a degree. Um, you can become a nurse, clinical nurse specialist and nurse educator. So there's so many different things you can do that um, doesn't limit you to working with patients anymore if that's not what you choose to do after bedside nursing. I know a lot, nurse practitioner is one of the ones where you will still have to um, work with patients and see them on a daily basis and treat them in a different way, more like a provider than as a nurse. So you'll be diagnosing, you'll be treating, you'll be prescribing medication and all of those things, which um, bedside nursing does not do, does not have the ability, it's not in their scope of practice. So a lot of people um, tend to kind of get burnt out from bedside nursing and want to explore other options. And so they pursue their MSN and they go down that path of um, not doing the grueling work of bedside nursing. Some people love it for many, many years, but other people kind of just feel like after a few years, it's not really what they imagine themselves doing for a long time. So um, for me personally, I love the hospital setting. So um, if and when I do move on to my MSN, I still would want to practice in a hospital setting. Um, there's a lot of people who choose to leave bedside nursing and then want to go and work in a clinic, which has more um, relaxed hours. It's more, it's more um, consistent, like nine to five hours. And you see like a certain amount of people in the community, depending on where you work, um, kind of like in an urgent care or things like that. That's like the best example I have of like what um, a clinic, clinic nurse would do. Um, those who don't want to be in a hospital setting anymore. Um, but for me, I want to be in a hospital setting, and so I would see more acute patients, so patients who would be in an ICU or, like, would be in a hospital for, for whatever reason. Um, and for that, I do need that work experience in a critical care setting. Um, and my specialty that I wish to pursue, um, acute care adult gerontology, it deals with patients um, who are adults, so from, like, age 18, I'm pretty sure it's a little lower than age 18. I'd be able to see patients who are a little younger than age 18 all the way to like past 100, you know, like, so it's like the adult population and the geriatric population. Um, and I really liked that because I felt like it gave me a large window of um, people to be able to see. And I personally felt during school that um, the adolescent and pediatric population just wasn't where um, I was called to, you know, serve. So um, it kind of eliminates that aspect for me so that I can put all my focus into a population that I feel like would really benefit from my interests and my um, future expertise. So hospital setting, adults, and older populations. So that's basically what I um, am going to pursue. But there's so many 
MSN specialties. Um, I believe my school offers about like nine or 10 different specialties, if I'm not mistaken. It's listed on their website. So like if you go on a school's website that has, um, that gives the opportunity to pursue an MSN, it'll list what specialties they offer. Not every school offers every kind of specialty. Um, some are limited, so you can definitely do your research and find what school offers what you want and what the criteria is for that. But there's so many paths that you can choose. Yeah, I mean, just hearing you talk about this, it's it's very complex. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it is. It's like the closer you, the more questions you ask, the more questions there are. It kind of feels like that, that uh, where you're, you're like, well, if you go down this path, and if you go down this path, then there's this option and this option. But if you go down this path, then there's these options. And there's kind yeah. of, it, it's really great. And for everyone watching, it's good to know because you don't exactly always have to know right where you want to end up because you can kind of start down the journey. And like you say, you can, if you want to keep going with your education, there's always that option to keep growing and whatever you learn is not going to be wasted. It's going to go mm -hmm. and move with you through all of the different areas that you go into and the specialties that you go into wherever you feel you're called to serve. So that's great mm -hmm. for the young people watching to remember that you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know, oh my gosh, do I have to know I, what, exactly where I want to be? Um, it sounds like you don't. You can start slow and then as you learn, you'll kind of um, become like Julia who knows all the avenues that you can take because you start to learn that as you go down this whole path and you, then you'll find your way. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I'll stay on the subject of nursing for a minute longer. I would love to, mm -hmm. uh, I know with your Instagram, you, you're really an advocate for other people who are pursuing um, a, a career in healthcare and you you really show up for people and want to guide them. I know that you help you answer things like how to apply to nursing school um, and you kind of offer a lot of advice through her Instagram, which of course we'll link in this video and everyone can go check it out. But while we have you on our podcast, um, is there any kind of advice you could give to pe young people who are looking to get into healthcare and specifically nursing? Um, any advice or anything you could tell them that you maybe wish you would have known? Yeah, um, definitely. One of the biggest things I feel like is um, once you're in nursing school, to keep an open mind, um, especially going back to what we talked about of all the avenues that you can pursue after nursing school. Um, I know not everyone is familiar with all the routes that you can take. And so keeping an open mind while you're in nursing school, learning as much as you can, but then also realizing that school prepares you, but it doesn't teach you absolutely everything. And that that's okay. I know one of the biggest things as a new graduate nurse is um, being in a position where you feel like you should know something, but you don't. And then you kind of start freaking out because you're like, oh my goodness, I know I learned this in this class, but I don't remember it. I've never seen it. I really don't know what to do in this situation. And that's totally okay. Um, when I was doing clinicals in nursing school, a nurse told me um, not to worry if I don't remember anything I learned in nursing school because everything you need to know for your practice will be taught to you on the floor in a practical setting. And that's not saying to just kind of um, close your ear to everything you're learning in nursing school, but that it's okay if you feel like you don't know what to do. There's going to be preceptors on the floor that are assigned to you to help you when you get a new job. There's going to be people, managers, other nurses that are always going to be willing to step in if you need help with something or if you forget. Even to this day, six weeks later, there's times where I call my preceptor, I'm like, oh my goodness, you just explained this to me a week ago, but I forgot. And she'll re-explain it and like, we'll go through it. I'll see things multiple times and you'll get the hang of it eventually. So my best advice for people per, trying to pursue nursing school is don't think that you're going to end up learning every absolute thing in school and to just be open-minded to continue learning after school as well, because nursing is just, you're going to learn so much all the time. And nursing, the concept of nursing stays the same, but times change and situations change. So you always have to be ready to adapt and learn more. So that will be, I feel like the advice that will keep you sane during nursing school and out of nursing school. That's such great advice. Yeah. And I think 
uh, just to add on what you were saying, not being afraid to ask a question if you don't know the answer, because no matter how long you've been doing something, no matter what your career is, you're not going to know everything. There's going to be situations that you've never dealt with before, that you've never seen, that you never read about, you never learned about. And um, there are people around you, your other nurses and staff and everyone who you can ask, you can go to for those questions and say, hey, I'm not really sure how to do this. And maybe they know the answer, maybe they don't, but it's always good to ask questions because, um, you know, it'll just get, guide you in the right direction. And that's also how you learn. So don't be afraid to ask questions. No one, people sometimes feel afraid, like, oh, I don't want to ask a question because someone's going to, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what I'm doing. But really, actually, it does the opposite. It shows that you're present and that you're aware and that you're thinking down the line. And you're like, I don't know this. Admitting that you don't know something is actually a very, very strong quality. So mm -hmm. I agree. Amazing. Okay, so I'd love to switch gears a little bit and talk. I want to know, um, can you tell us a little bit, I want everyone to get to know you personally a little bit. So you can, can you tell us where you, where you're from, where you grew up, and tell us a little bit about like what other hobbies and interests you have outside of healthcare? So I am um, originally from India. Um, I'm from a little southern state uh, known as Kerala in South India. Um, i immigrated here when I was two years old. So I've pretty much been in America, uh, like a majority of the life that I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, we immigrated to New Jersey and that's where I lived most of my life. Um, I grew up there. I went to like started school there, went to school, went to undergrad there. Um, my family, my parents and my younger brother are still there. Um, and then when I decided to pursue nursing um, a year after I graduated from undergrad, I moved to Cleveland, Ohio. So that was the first time that I ever really left New Jersey um, to go and live somewhere else. Yeah. And um, I ended up living with my brother who uh, was doing, he actually um, is doing his residency in Cleveland. So I wasn't completely alone, but it was a good transition step. Um, so I moved to Cleveland and studied there for two years and then I eventually made my way to Oklahoma City because um, my husband is from Oklahoma so like he's born and raised here and we were together like all throughout when I was in nursing school and even before I got into nursing school so um, the natural progression just seemed to make sense that I would end up in Oklahoma so that was probably the biggest change for me adjusting to life in Oklahoma because um, I personally don't have any family here um, he has all his family and our community is pretty large here. Our um, Kerala community is pretty large here. So that's, that's a comforting factor, but it was definitely a very big step away from always being around my own family and my own, you know, friend group and things like that. Yeah. Um, is it, and I, just to kind of go off of that, I do have another question. Like, and that has to be really hard being away from your family. And I can relate to that because I'm on the same boat. Like most of my family is in Colorado and, um, and I know as being a nurse and being around and, and seeing all of this stuff with COVID and the global pandemic, I imagine that just being away from your family is really hard, especially yeah. during a global pandemic, especially because of what you do and what you know, mm -hmm. and the knowledge that you have about it. Um, mm -hmm. I know that that has to be like a stressful thing and a, and a worry that you have because your family is so far. Do you give them yeah. advice and stuff and tell them like, make sure you stay inside and wear your masks and have <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my family has been giving me advice. So my mom is a nurse um, and she worked in an ICU for quite a bit of her career and just recently um, started working in an endoscopy clinic. So she started having a more consistent schedule and she's starting to relax now that most of the kids are out of the house. Um, but during the beginning of the pandemic in New Jersey, New Jersey and New York were hit very hard. Um, they're still, you know, taking a lot of precautions to make sure that nothing gets worse because they are such a dense, like very densely populated states. Um, so during that time, my mom actually was called back from her endoscopy clinic because of her ICU background and she was called to the ICU floor to help with COVID patients. So that was actually pretty scary for me because my mom, you know, she's not young anymore. She's in that age group that's very vulnerable. She does have underlying conditions. My dad also has underlying conditions. So it was kind of that worry of like, oh my goodness, my mom just got out of this kind of a situation, is being called back because of her experience. 
and could possibly bring something back home to my dad and to herself. So that was definitely a worry. And me not being there, you know, like it, it definitely was worrisome. Um, my younger brother is an EMT, so he also gets put in situations where he could possibly get exposed to COVID. So just not being there with the three of them at that time, there's not much I probably would have been able to do if I was there. But the fact that I wasn't able to be with them and just kind of had to worry from afar, it was definitely tough. But I mean, my mom has experience in this stuff. So she and my dad were very careful. Um, they made my brother be super careful as well. Um, it, it's gotten better because of the PPE situation, but there was a time where like, you know, there weren't a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of PPE available for people outside of the hospital setting. So um, they, they did their best to kind of quarantine themselves and limit their um, exposure to outside. I know like my dad, my brother would say that my dad would like spray him down with um, sanitizer every time he tried to come into the house. Like just to, like, like, be, like bug spray. I like, can't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then my mom, my mom stayed in the basement for a majority of the time where she was called onto the floors that had COVID uh -huh. patients. So away from my dad and my brother to minimize any risk of exposure so they made quite a lot of adjustments um, to the way that they live daily life and even now like it's, it's gotten a little more relaxed but they're still very very careful there and it's hard to understand because in Oklahoma it's not really um, as scary as that um, because I personally don't think that Oklahoma being a state that's not as densely populated, I don't think that Oklahoma really suffered the way that states in the Northeast did. So we didn't really experience the height of the fear that I feel like states like New Jersey and New York faced. Um, so to hear all the adjustments my parents made, for me here, it was kind of just like, I was like, man, they're doing so much to, you know, literally be able to live life as normally as they can. Meanwhile, we're here and yes, we're quarantining. Um, me and my husband personally, we like limited our exposure and all of that going out and things like that in the beginning. Um, but cases definitely aren't as high as they were in the Northeast. So in general, I feel like people don't um, take the rules as seriously here. Um, and especially there's no statewide um, mandate. Um, it's left up to the counties and up until the like a month ago our county didn't require masks out in public and things like that. So we're it, it was slow in the beginning and now it's it's starting to get more on par with what we see in the Northeast. But even then there's there's a lot of people who will you know wear a mask to get into a store but then once they're in the store they like take the mask off. So it's just you have to be very careful yourself because not everybody is abiding by the recommendations. So um, it's very different to see how things were done here and how things were done in the Northeast. So being away from family kind of scared me with that too. <laughs> so yeah, I imagine that's really scary. I know if there's this seems to be this discrepancy between people who want to wear them and people who don't. But we stand with, you know, obviously wear your masks, protect mm -hmm. yourself and others, social distance, quarantine if you can, you know, all of that stuff. But I just discovered something new that you said that I really want to ask you about. You said that your mom was an ICU nurse. You're, that's what you're doing now. You said your brother was an EMT. And then I, I don't know if it's the same brother or not, but you had said your brother uh, was a, in residency. So is, yeah. does that mean your entire family almost is in <laughs> So that is really yeah, my older brother is in residency. My younger brother does EMT on the side, and he's still he's still completing his undergrad um, with the hopes of going to medical school. So aside from my father, yes, most of us are in the medical field. My dad is an engineer by education, um, but yeah, so pretty much a lot of the at least my family right outside my immediate family, there is a little more variety in career um, and <laughs> profession. So incredibly amazing. I would actually love to get them. I'd love to have all of you on the podcast because I think <laughs> so cool. The whole family of superheroes over here. Guys, <laughs> wow, what a giving. Like I, I talk about this a lot, but um, to be in healthcare, it's it takes such a heart a certain kind of heart of just like an empathy and a care for others and a sacrifice. And it's a really, really beautiful thing. And it's, um, mm -hmm. I, I get a little like emotional about it because I know how hard you guys work and you, like we talked about earlier, you guys are there for literally the scariest moments of our lives. Uh, and sometimes the happiest when we're having babies and stuff like that. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's so incredible that you're almost your entire family is in healthcare. 
<laughs> wow. Thank you guys for, for your dedication and to keeping us all safe. You're welcome. <laughs> we do our best. <laughs> you guys are killing it. <laughs> that might not be the right word, actually. <laughs> Let's see. So what outside of healthcare, can you tell me a little bit like what you like to do with your time? Yeah, um, I really like to do things that I feel like bring me some mental peace. So I love to paint. That's always been a hobby of mine growing up. Um, I just kind of sit down, put newspapers all over the floor, and then get ideas from Pinterest, and I just like paint canvases. Um, I like to cook. So that has really been helping me and my husband save a lot of money during quarantine since we can't eat out as much. Um, so we've been home cooking a lot of our meals and trying – um, new recipes and breaking out the instant pot and crock pot and things that we just kind of had stored away and finding new ways to create things. Um, and I feel like that that actually is a really big stress relief for me cooking. Um, it's not so great for my weight gain, but it's uh, awesome for my mental peace. <laughs> um, and then uh, we have a little dog, um, a little Yorkie that's been kind of keeping us occupied during quarantine as well. And I've always wanted a puppy and this was kind of the perfect time. So it has taught me a lot about responsibility and patience and yeah. consistency. So um, I love kind of just putting my mind to a task and um, working to accomplish those tasks. So the most recent example is like training our dog. It's, it's, it's <laughs> quite a, it's quite an experience because he is a very stubborn dog, but in those moments where you just work really hard and find new ways and he finally listens to a command that you've been trying to teach him forever, those kinds of things really, really like make me happy. So, um, I like, I like a challenge. So <laughs> that definitely keeps me on my toes for now, but yeah. So there's not too much that you can do in times like this because it's hard to go out and, you know, eating out is one of my hobbies. I'm a really big foodie, but it's, it's very hard to do that um, nowadays. We try to be as safe as we can when we do go out to eat, but it's not like we can, you know, hit up our friends and be like, hey, let's go grab dinner here. So cooking at home has been something that has taken up our time and painting. We've been working on puzzles together, things that we can do together too, because a lot of these things I used to do by myself, but now, you know, I have someone else that we have to do everything together because I'm not just going to leave him hanging while I, while I do fun things myself. So it's been, it's been very interesting to kind of adjust the hobbies that we've had to work during quarantine. I think it's great advice too, to just do whatever you can do for your mental health, to keep yourself kind of sane and you know yourself best. So you know what that, what those things are. It's mm -hmm. great to have creative outlets. It's great to just kind of have something that centers you and brings you back home. Um, so that's really great advice. Well, Julia, it was such a pleasure having you on our podcast. Of course, we're going to link all her information below so you guys can check her out. She's here for all advice you have, any questions. She's a huge advocate for you guys. So um, thank you so, so much. for. It was really a pleasure to have you today. Thank you for having me.